Welcome back to Capitol Hill Ocean Talk live from the museum at Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2016. I'm your host, Kate Thompson. As we burn fossil fuels like oil and natural gas for energy for our cars, homes, and electronics, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Some of this carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean and is changing the ocean's chemistry, which in turn is threatening many ocean organism, organisms and ecosystems. Today, we'll discuss the science of ocean acidification and how organizations are working to protect our ocean from this global threat. Don't forget to join the conversation by tweeting us questions using hashtag chow2016 or chat us at oceanslive.org. I'm very, very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Libby Jewett, the director of NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Since the founding of the program in 2000 and whatever, Libby has been developing the organizing responses to ocean acidification. <laughs> We're also joined by my colleague, Dr. Steve Giddings. Steve is the science coordinator for the National Marine Sanctuary System and, with the pro and is our program's head scientist to better understand sanctuary ecosystems, track changing conditions, and reduce human impacts. We'll be talking with him about the impacts of ocean acidification in national marine sanctuaries. Next, we also have, and we're excited to have, Dr. Kimberly Yates with us today. Kimberly is the Senior Research Scientist at the United States Geological Survey's Coastal and Marine Science Center, where she researches the effect of ocean acidification on coral reef health and growth. Next is Dr. Jonathan Pennock, Director of the New Hampshire Sea Grant and Deputy Director of the School of Marine Sciences and Ocean Engineering at the University of New Hampshire. We'll talk with Jonathan about the effects of ocean acidification in the Gulf of Maine. Finally is Dr. Sarah Cooley, the director of the Ocean Acidification Program at the Ocean Conservancy, where she focuses on how global ocean changes like ocean acidification affect human communities. Thanks everybody for joining me today in the studio for this very, very important topic, ocean acidification, which is also very difficult to understand. So we're gonna do our best to communicate it to everybody. So I just wanted to start us out, break the ice a little bit, get us comfortable. Uh, I'd like to show an image. Give me one word for what you all think and what you feel when you see this image. Libby. Ah! <laughs> Steve. I'd have to say uh, a warning. Okay. Sad. Sad. Mm -hmm. Scary. Scary. Stark? Stark. Mm -hmm. So this image invokes some pretty scary <laughs> words from all of you. Uh, the ocean is vast, and those are very, very small things that come from the ocean. Why do I need to be concerned about that if it's out of sight, out of mind? Uh, Libby, can you explain a little bit why that's such a concern? So you uh, explained a little bit. I wanted just to, to, to step back and talk about what ocean acidification is just very quickly. I don't want to get too wonky on people and go into too much chemistry, um, but just say, yes, you know, increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the, the ocean is literally like a sponge, it takes up everything that's, that's all the gases that are in the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide, literally, when it comes into the ocean, combines with water molecules and creates something called carbonic acid. And it's because of that that we're, we have this increasing acidification of the ocean. Now, why are we concerned? Well, you saw a picture there, which is showing uh, a pteropod, small swimming bottom of the food chain organism, um, that is literally dissolving when it comes into contact with waters, um, corrosive waters. So um, what, what is concerning about ocean acidification is it's actually, um, there have been uh, examples in, in geological history of, of um, increases in CO2 in the atmosphere, but what is happening now is faster than uh, any time in the past at least 50 million years, if not 300 million years. And we don't know if the marine organisms, the, the, the one in seven people in our, in our, in our world that rely on, on protein from the sea, if they're going to have that protein still. Like, can these organisms adapt? Um, they they um, evolved in relatively stable chemical conditions that are now changing. Um, and in fact, on our, on our west coast, we're, we're already seeing impacts on the oyster industry. And I think uh, hopefully many people have heard that story now, but um, it's one that is very concerning. And, and so we'll see what the other yeah. folks have to say. Well, I, you know, the, the population of people that eat, that eat seafood yeah. and, and the protein that we, that we get from the ocean is, you know, at a, such a high level that this is really concerning. So yeah. we're going to 
chill quick clip from the Ocean Conservancy. It's called High Hopes, the Future of Dungeness Crab. If crabs were to disappear from the picture, I think it would be the end of my fishing career at this point. And I think you'd see a mass sort of die off of, of the fishing industry. We've kind of developed our societies with the marine ecology as it is right now. So any kind of profound shift in that is going to have big economic and cultural impacts. So, Dr. Giddings, we, I mean, the National Marine Sanctuaries are across the country. They're in cold water, they're in warm water, you know, they're where those crabs are. Can you tell us a little bit about what National Marine Sanctuaries are doing to better understand ocean acidification? Well, marine sanctuaries are places where we generally have pretty high concentrations of the very resources you saw on that screen, crabs and many, many other things. They're relatively small places compared to the world ocean, but they give us, they're a place where we can focus our attention, focus our studies, focus our measurements in ways that help us understand the bigger ocean as well. So, uh, but they are relatively small, but they're very important for that reason. So they're good places to study it. And people are very concerned about what goes on in marine sanctuaries, and it's very helpful then to raise, it helps us raise awareness to the bigger problem as well. But on the instrument level, we actually have instruments in various sanctuaries now focusing on this emerging issue and measuring it. And we are seeing confirmation about ocean acidification manifesting in sanctuaries. We're seeing water quality changes happen in these sanctuaries where we're measuring pH and CO2 levels. So that one of the one of the places where we've been doing it the longest off Georgia, off Gray's Reef, is uh, in partnership with the University of Georgia. Dr. Scott Noakes down there has been working in, on maintaining, installing, and measuring acidification down there. Um, and we're seeing it happen. We're also understanding now some of the coastal processes that make the problem worse. It's not all about, it's not only about addition of CO2 worldwide, but there are coastal problems like wa freshwater resedimentation, upwelling, and other issues that happen only along the coast that make the problem even worse for co some coastal areas. So we're seeing it manifest mostly in terms of instrumentation and measurement now, and we're looking closely to see if it shows up now at the organismal level in ways that ha it already has shown up, as Libby points out, in the oyster industry, where they're getting larvae that don't even grow to adults because of the problem. We're looking for that in sanctuaries as well. So sanctuaries protect oysters, they, pr they, they protect kelp forests, and also coral reefs. So Kim, can you tell us a little bit about how ocean acidification is, is impacting coral reef communities? Much of what we know about how ocean acidification is affecting coral reefs, coral reefs actually comes from experimental research. One of our biggest concerns is that results of that research indicate that ocean acidification can decrease the rates of growth of coral reefs, and it can also cause certain parts of the reef structure and the surrounding seafloor to dissolve. Uh, many of these reefs form over thousands of years, hundreds to thousands of years, as marine organisms like corals and shellfish create skeletons and shells out of a mineral that we call calcium carbonate. Over the years, of, as these animals live and die, their shells and skeletons begin to accumulate or pile up on the seafloor. And some of these break down into what we call carbonate sand. That sand fills in the cracks and crevices of the reef and it creates hard surfaces for more corals to grow. And this is what allows coral reefs to continue growing upward and to keep up with rising sea level. And it also creates the three-dimensional structure uh, that we associate with coral reefs on the seafloor. One of our biggest concerns is that because these reefs grow so slowly, um, and because we've seen reefs degrading very quickly um, over the years, we're concerned about their ability to keep up with rising sea level and to create that three-dimensional structure on the seafloor. Ocean acidification actually decreases the rates at which reef-building organisms like, like corals and shellfish can create their skeletons and shells, and it also can dissolve the skeleton shells and carbonate sands created from uh, that process. 
one of our biggest concerns is that uh, we see reefs throughout the Caribbean, Pacific, and Atlantic Oceans already not growing fast enough to keep up with rising sea level. Um, and some of those reefs are actually beginning to erode. It was projected that coral reef uh, growth would decrease by as much as 60% by mid-century. And so up until now, it's been cons ocean acidification has been considered an emerging threat for coral reefs. Some new research results just came out that show that coral reefs in the Florida Keys are already beginning to dissolve during certain times of the year. Um, and this is particularly alarming because this is a condition that we didn't expect to occur for another few decades. And so this indicates that ocean acidification is actually already occurring and is not an emerging threat, but it's a threat that's already here. No. So we have the, the heat of the Florida Keys uh, and we are going now up to the cold of the Gulf of Maine. I, John, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you don't think of ocean acidification for me anyway, for cold water. I think of it as a hot water right, thing. Right. So it's actually happening faster in cold water, correct? Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on the conditions and that's the complex chemistry, but um, certainly colder waters, the upwelling areas on our Pacific Northwest coast that Libby referred to is where we're seeing a lot of um, impacts sooner and certainly with coral reefs and, and where the whole ecosystem is based on calcium carbonate is very important. I think what's interesting in an area like the Gulf of Maine, and I think it's just representative of some of the local effects and regional effects that you can have with ocean acidification. We have the, the global reach of CO2 coming in, and then there are things in different environments, different ecosystems where there are differences. And in the Gulf of Maine, which is one of our um, historically largest fisheries in the country, I mean, as, we, as, the, as the country formed, um, it was a lot of the resources coming out of the Gulf of Maine that were critical, and that remains so today. Our fishing communities um, are very important. It's important to the coastal economy. Um, for ocean acidification, the concern in an area like the Gulf of Maine is enhanced by the fact that it is cold water. There's cold water coming out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There's a lot of fresh water um, relative to a lot of other areas in the country. The amount of fresh water that comes into the Gulf is very high, and both of those things uh, chemically um, enhance the concern for ocean acidification and some of the measurements that, that Steve refers to. So our concern in the Gulf of Maine is maybe not quite as specific as just, oh, the coral reefs or the oysters that we get on the, the uh, west coast, but it's the ecosystem itself. It's the larval forms of fish, lobsters, mm -hmm. the commercially important fisheries, particularly the larval forms. It's not that it wouldn't be the adults, but what we're um, really interested in is understanding those ecosystem dynamics and, the, and what is um, going on in that food web ecosystem process versus the whole of the Gulf of Maine eroding like a coral reef could, um, there, there's a lot of indication that there are issues for a lot of those species. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the, the primary concern is. So Sarah, the Ocean Conservancy obviously works globally on many different ocean conservation issues. Uh, do you think all hope is lost here? No, definitely not. There are a number of ways that we can take action, and we're already starting to see a whole lot of action developing on ocean acidification. Um, we help promote that by bringing science into the policy conversation. Um, we have a bunch of tools in our toolbox that we use to do that. Um, but we basically uh, synthesize the science, we use strategic communications to get those messages to the people who need to hear them, and then we uh, engage with policy at different levels, at the state level, the federal level, and even the international level, as you say. Um, we create champions for ocean acidification within industries, mm -hmm. and um, like fisheries, for example, the Pacific oyster fishery has had a number of spokespeople who have been willing to speak out on the issue and say something needs to be done. And because of their willingness to speak out, there have been really effective industry research partnerships put together in the Pacific Northwest that have helped that Pacific oyster industry get around this problem and come up with ways to safeguard their industry. And another way that Ocean Conservancy works is we also help lead scientific synthetic studies to help bring together all of the different pieces of science that are being done and really um, identify knowledge gaps and opportunities for um, finding out more or bringing, those, uh, bringing what we do know into the policy space. And we've been finding that um, what we know about 
um, ocean or coastal water quality and um, nutrient loading and things like that is really shining a light on opportunities we have to maybe take some steps to safeguard coastal water quality and ease the burden of ocean acidification on coastal ecosystems. So that's another really great opportunity for us to make a difference. And another thing Ocean Conservancy does is we help educate policymakers on the science. And what we do is we hold briefings and one-on-one -on -one education meetings um, with, the, with the legislators to highlight new findings. And um, this has actually often led to policymakers taking action on their own to initiate legislation to put in um, research funding or to encourage the application of new technologies to look at the problem more deeply and to understand exactly what the capacity is of coastal organisms or even deep sea organisms to either adapt to the new conditions or to maybe find a new niche in the ecosystem that will serve them better. And we've seen a real increase in interest in ocean acidification. In just the past three years, we have seen a real uptick in federal funding. We've seen it grow from $6 million in 2014, funded through NOAA for this issue, to um, $10 million in 2016. And this is even in a very difficult budget climate. So even, um, it, it, we're also seeing that there is a good deal of bipartisan support for this issue. And so in a difficult funding climate, with bipartisan support for this issue, people are taking action. We are seeing great progress um, on committing to research and monitoring and education. We are seeing folks willing to think creatively about how to find solutions that could safeguard their businesses or help their, uh, their local communities withstand or offset acidification. And um, you know, we, we see a great example of this in Florida right now. We are about to hold a round table next week um, on ocean acidification to educate lawmakers and citizens about the issue. Kim's going to be a speaker, I'm so pleased. <laughs> and uh, we also have other confirmed speakers who include um, Representative Ileana Rose Leighton, uh, State Representative Holly Reshine, and the Mayor of Miami, Tomas Regalado. And we're seeing this bipartisan support throughout the country on this issue. And we're so pleased that we're seeing that. People are really stepping up and starting to figure out creative ways to safeguard our local resources against this issue. So Libby, I mean obviously you are all up on ocean acidification and you know the so what and we've talked about the so what mm -hmm. but I mean how about the public that doesn't have a clue what ocean acidification is? What, how do they help us to mitigate what's going on? Well, I think it's uh, part of our mission and, and all of our missions has been to uh, connect the information that we're, we're learning about ocean acidification with everybody because the solution is in actually reducing the CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. And we all have a part in that. And until people appreciate, one, what they can do um, and what effect what they do will have on the ocean, then in fact, even if they're located in the center of the country, that their actions actually have a ramification for the ocean, that they, they need to love the ocean, they need to want to protect it, and then make those connections scientifically. You know, I, th I think we're, you know, it's taking a little bit of time. It took, a, it took quite a while for people to appreciate global climate change. <laughs> you know, ocean acidification is, is an even newer topic, but the fact that we're having this panel here, that we have supportive NGOs, that we have this really international community. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to go back and say um, I'm so proud because the United States is really leading this, one of the foremost leaders in terms of countries. And when we look at the publications coming out that are trying to get at, okay, what can we do? What effects is ocean acidification having? Um, you know, the 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 majority of those publications are coming out of the U.S. So, you know, we were a little slow stepping up to the plate, but, you know, we've, we've hit it in a big way. Right, yeah. right. Well, I mean, and that's, that's what, I mean, it, 
unlike some other issues that we might have. Like we, we were talking about marine debris earlier yeah. today. So obviously that's a global international mm -hmm. issue. One ocean, all interconnected. Yeah. Same thing with ocean acidification. So you had mentioned us as a forerunner. What are who, who are some of the other countries that are working actively on ocean acidification issues? So we were um, there was actually just recently a conference in Australia um, that was that was called Oceans in a High CO2 World, uh, and 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 that was actually back to back with a global ocean acidification observing network meeting, and there um, we had 40 plus countries represented. Um, and so the, some of the leaders are uh, the U.S., um, you know, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, Monaco, um, Australia, now China, Japan, Korea, um, and, and Spain, and Italy, but now Africa and Latin America. We have a Latin American network. Wow. Um, Chile, Chile and Brazil are sort of leading that effort. So. It, it really is becoming a global effort, which is okay. very exciting. That is very, very yeah. exciting. So, John, I'm going to bring it back to the United States, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go back up, up north uh, and tell me a little bit about what New Hampshire Sea Grant is, is doing to help mitigate it. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, and as Libby didn't mention, I think that, that within the, uh, their interagency task force in the, yeah. in the U.S., which has really worked. Sea Grant is, a, uh, if you don't know, a federal state partnership. It's housed in NOAA. Um, I think one of the unique aspects that Sea Grant brings to the table for ocean acidification, but other processes, is that we are really an, uh, an avenue into the university research and the power that we have in our universities around the country. So some of the data that um, is being brought to bear is being produced not only in the national laboratories, but also at the university. Sea Grant is one mechanism um, into those. And probably what's even more unique is we, um, Sea Grant is a, a place-based group within NOAA. So we have in 33 states, there are Sea Grant programs that do a number of different things. But one of the things we do is we're, we're out there on the docks with the fishermen. And so one of the things that Sea Grant, New Hampshire Sea Grant's doing that, but uh, many of our other programs all do the same thing, is we're talking to the people who are actually out there. They are the economy. They are the ones whose families are being affected. And we try to bring that information back into the national dialogue uh, to make sure that as we start to learn more and, and invest our resources, that we're doing that in the places that can make the most impact soon. Um, and then we work from that. I mean, we work with Libby's office, the, uh, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program office. Those of us in the Northeast just recently had a, a request for proposals, went to the university community. We have a number of proposals that, that we are funding to add to the, the research. Um, it, I, I will step back. I don't want to, you know, you can look at me. I've, I had gray hair from when I was in high school. But, <laughs> I, and Steve could talk, all of us could talk about this. I think when I was going to undergraduate and graduate work and you got out to the ocean, acidification and uh, in the coastal zone was something we all knew could happen with eutrophication and high production and the rest. But for the most part, when you got out into the open ocean, the message from us, even at the, when I went through my PhD um, program, was, well, you know, that's not something we really need to worry about. So in just a few decades, this has really taken off to where we're now documenting all that. And we're, we are going to be playing catch up on the science that is needed, and that's going to be at a, at a number of different levels. So Sea Grant is one part of that piece. Our colleagues at MIT, uh, they, they invested almost all of the research dollars that they had for this year. Um, in ocean acidification uh, processes because that's what they heard back um, from the fishermen and the people in their communities, much like the folks in Miami and others who, who have an interest in that. So that we just need to continue to work together um, between the different agencies the, the, from the local level up to the federal level and international okay. level uh, to really address, right. address the issue. Well, you had mentioned st stakeholders, the fishermen, the users. They're the ones that are noticing it and coming to you, exactly. which is like mm -hmm. usually the opposite. Go away, research science. You're going to shut down my fishery. But they're the ones coming right. to you. I think that's, that's, that's and impressive. And aquaculturist. And aquaculturist as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in the National Marine Sanctuary System, we actually have advisory councils mm -hmm. for each of our sanctuary sites. And uh, was it, what, Steve? 
three years ago, four years ago, a couple of our advisory councils, ocean acidification was the topic that they wanted to make a stand on. They wanted to write letters about it. They wanted these our sites to, you know what, shift your priorities and tar let's start focusing on ocean acidification. So in talking about that, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about how these sanctuary sites are becoming places for these studies to occur? Well, in fact, every sanctuary advisory council sent a letter to the, the director urging more consideration of acidification. That's the only, I think that's the only issue we've ever had that happen on. Right, right. So it was clearly a concern recognized by our constituents and our representative, people that represent different communities in the, around the country. So that was a, a, a starting point for us. Now we're considering the development in co collaboration with the Ocean Acidification Program and anybody else, Sea Grant, who, who, who's out there doing the, the good work partnering up with us in sanctuaries to create sentinel sites around the country that, it, that sanctuaries can become where we can focus not just uh, instruments but all kinds of research related to this problem and other problems that are associated with it um, so we can better understand and get early warnings of problems and understand how ecosystems actually work so we can understand what are the links between acidification and all the other stressors that happen. Uh, Sarah had started getting at the, a very important point that's often lost Reduce other stressors. If you can't do anything else, and you live in the middle of America, reduce other stressors somehow, and acidification won't be as big a problem as we think it is. So there's a, there's a very important report that was put out a year or two ago called the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plant Climate Adaptation mm -hmm. Strategy. It had seven major recommendations on things we should do, including reducing carbon production, CO2 production. Mm -hmm. The last one was reduce other stressors. Mm -hmm. Well, I, at the time, I thought that should be number one, and all <laughs> right. the other ones... You can, Come after that. Yeah, you, you can't not do them, <laughs> but, but that should have been number one, because I think that's a super important thing. And right. sanctuaries are the kinds of places where you can study those things right. and create the, understand the linkages, and then we can help reduce other stressors in addition to doing things that we yeah. know mitigate uh, acidification, like healthy coastal uh, kelp forests, healthy seagrass beds which help actually change local chemistry enough to mitigate, to reduce the impacts of acidification mm -hmm. just in the local area, but it's something. It's something, right. So, uh, Kim, lots of agencies are starting to take the charge of ocean acidification. It's, it seems, I think, I think, Libby, you mentioned earlier, the climate discussion happened much slower. Like, it wasn't like this call to arms, like ocean acidification really feels like it has been in the last couple of years. I mean, for... Uh, policymakers to say, hey, you need to prioritize this for communities and stakeholders to say, hey, you need to prioritize this, whether I'm in Texas or I'm in Florida or if I'm in Maine or up in Washington, off the coast of Washington. So, can what you're, you're with USGS. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how USGS has made this a priority. One of the things that we mentioned, uh, one of the biggest challenges with respect to understanding ocean acidification and doing something to address it is the fact that it addresses all aspects of ecosystems. Um, so you really have to understand how it's affecting whole ecosystem processes. And one of the things that we're doing at USGS is we're actually a multi-disciplinary uh, agency and we're able to address studies at whole ecosystem levels from a variety of different scientific disciplines. And so what we're doing is we're using an approach that we call uh, an integrated seascape approach to study how climate change and ocean acidification and also non-climate driven stressors affect environments like coral reefs and other ecosystems. And what that means is we have teams of scientists from several different science disciplines including chemists, geologists, biologists, physical scientists, all working together across their science disciplines to understand how ocean acidification and other stressors can affect the chemistry and physics and biology of environment and also how chemical, physical, and biological processes interact in, uh, to, with ocean acidification. One of the reasons why we're doing this is because we want to be able to measure the changes that are actually taking place in these ecosystems and then also to be able to determine how much of that change is caused by ocean acidification as opposed to some of these other stressors on a reef. And so we use that process to uh, look at impacts from ocean acidification at whole ecosystem scales. We're also using that approach to study how biology, chemistry, and physics interact to create conditions that provide resilience to marine organisms in certain areas. And this has actually allowed us to identify some places that are actually serving as refuges from climate change and ocean acidification for a variety of marine organisms. 
And then lastly, we also couple that kind of approach uh, with synthesis of historical um, data and information and also prehistorical data and information from the geologic record so that we can tell how things have changed over longer time periods and so that we can use that information to actually better predict right. how ocean acidification is going to impact environments in the future. Right. We do these types of studies in Atlantic, Caribbean, and Pacific reefs, and most of these studies are done in partnership with NOAA, um, the National Park Service, and uh, very many different state, local, and academic partners as well. Wow, that's, so. that's one great partnership story. We actually have a question from Twitter, uh, so people are following, yeah. yay! Mm -hmm. Uh, we have this question, it says, how can shellfish and other organisms adapt to ocean acidification, or can they? So why don't, why don't we go ahead and let you take yeah, that one, John. No, that's a, a terrific question, and that's actually what a lot of the research is going on. I would say probably three quarters of the proposals that we will be funding in this cycle we just started are really looking at the resilience of individual um, individual organisms and species, but also the, the communities around. So it may be that there is a one species of oyster that is really gonna struggle, um, but there might be another that can fill that same niche that will, will do better. So it really is, um, there, I, I think we don't know. I think the jury is out. It depends on the organism as to whether they can adapt or not. I think it really goes back to what Libby said at the beginning, that I think what scares us the most is that the rate of change uh, is so great right now. So evolution has its way of adapting and community shifting, but we're right now moving out of a, a geological period of what I would just call stasis, where we, we've had a fairly a constant run with not a whole lot of variability, and, and the earth cycles. Um, but right now we're seeing rates of change that the scary part is it may, um, out, over, overrun, outrun the ability of organisms to adapt. Right. Libby, you said you were going to yeah, say something. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, that th this question of adaptation is very much on the cutting edge of research right now, and um, we, knew, we know this is a, a question we need to answer. And in this recent conference that I was at, it was very exciting to hear that scientists are actually trying to set up you know, very elaborate experiments to try and get at that. And one of the things, for instance, um, now we're exposing the parents to ocean to OA conditions, and then seeing in some cases if the parents are exposed, that then their offspring actually mm. do have resilience. Oh, not every case. So some yes, and then some not. So, mm. or if you expose the the eggs, and then that though that generation is not so tolerant. Um, then, but then their offspring, the ones that survive, maybe. So it's, it's a, and I, yeah, yeah Kim yeah, might have some. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to jump in and say um, also, you know, there are some winners with respect to ocean acidification, and some of those winners can actually help locally uh, protect yeah. things like corals and shellfish. So, for example, some marine seagrasses mm -hmm. and algae actually benefit from ocean acidification because it increases their growth rate. And those things, as they grow through a process called photosynthesis, can actually take up carbon out of the water and increase the pH. And so that actually creates what we call a buffering condition. It buffers against ocean acidification. And so things like shellfish and corals that are growing in and near seagrass beds may actually get some protection. And in fact, we're seeing certain places in the world where this is actually happening. And we've actually just recently discovered that even some very select mangrove habitats are now protecting corals from both ocean acidification and thermal stress. And this is a very, very new discovery. It's something that we haven't seen before in the geologic record. And corals don't usually like to grow in mangroves. That's not something that's very common. And we think that this might actually be what we call a novel ecosystem mm -hmm. response or a new ecosystem response to unprecedented rates of global climate change. Mm -hmm. And so through perhaps some ad adaptation, and then local protection by way of these refuge and resiliency conditions. There is some hope for seeing these things through. Steve, you were, were you gonna? I want to add one more consideration. Yeah. This whole buffering system we've been talking about that we all learned first in Chemistry 101, yeah. oceanography. If the buffering system really is as disrupted as we think it is, and it's not buffering against pH change now, it's not done changing. So I'm really concerned that things that look like they might be adapting now, 50 years from now might be under even harsher conditions. So we have to worry about that. And right. it, goes me, it takes me back to this idea of taking our foot off the gas. 
and really right. still worrying about this right. uh, problem. Right. You know, it's funny, it's interesting is I always thought as a diver, when you saw the algae, it was a bad thing. <laughs> like the coral was covered with algae and it was like, wait a minute, no, this isn't good, this isn't healthy. But I think it's interesting. And, and then I think it was Steve that actually showed me, if you lift up that algae, there's the, there's the baby brain coral <laughs> underneath there, you know, potentially being either, you know, safe, I don't know. But buffering is at least, wow, that's an interesting, I hadn't heard that. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to go back uh, to finish this out here. Sarah, uh, you know, the ocean, like I said earlier, the Ocean Conservancy talked about around the world, and we mm -hmm. talked about some of these other countries and, and what they're doing, but how can we all work together? Well, we can all work together by trying to cut carbon dioxide sooner rather than later. That's mm -hmm. the first and biggest thing, but it's also the hardest. Um, but each of us can do something to think about how can we go a little easier on the ocean today. Um, and in a lot of ways, decreasing your carbon footprint, decreasing how much energy you use, that's all going to pay off. That's going to help out with this problem. And at the same time, people can um, let their decision makers know, this is an important issue to me. I want you to think about how ocean acidification can be made a priority. And we're already seeing the fruits of that, so that's really successful. And then I think um, as, as we all kind of work ourselves together in one big mess, we will find the solutions big, cutting the CO2, and very small, the regional redu reduction of stressors that we need to do at the same time. Well, it's just so wonderful to hear all these amazing things that are going on and that there is an alarm bell and that people are responding to it. So thank you so much for joining me today and for discussing this timely and important subject. Thank so, you. Yeah. Ocean acidification is impacting ecosystems across the globe as well as the communities that depend on them. These organizations are working hard to understand and address these issues, and we thank you for it so much. So at 1.15 p.m., Chow will turn to offshore energy with a panel on how developing a mix of offshore energy sources can help mitigate climate change impacts, like ocean acidification, <laughs> and diminish economic risks. We'll be back with Capitol Hill Ocean Talk at 2.30 p.m. with a panel on making sustainable seafood decisions. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching.